universe. And when you're anchored in that, then you no longer think the universe is kind. You know that it is benevolent. And other people might think you're cuckoo and, you know, what's he smoking or what kind of trip is he on? And I want that trip and so on. But people who, who are there will recognize what I'm talking about. It, it's no longer something up for questioning. You know in the deepest possible way. And if you've been doing this long enough, eventually every single one will get to that point where you know that, it, you know, in my program, I say the point you want to get to is where you have a very deep sense of well-being. I don't talk about happiness in the normal way. We're very cavalier talking about happiness. I had a great meal, so I'm happy. Or, you know, I saw a wonderful movie or a play and I'm happy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a very deep sense of well-being. The knowledge that you're okay, the knowledge that you have always been okay, the knowledge that you will always be okay. In fact, you cannot not be okay. You're in the human condition. As long as you're in the human condition, stuff will happen. There will be relationship problems. There will be career setbacks. There will be financial lack. All of that is part of being in the human condition. And you will deal with each of these situations as appropriate when they arise. But you will do it from the space of, I am okay. I have always been okay. And I will always be okay. And you can anchor yourself in that when you realize that the universe is friendly. That's why Einstein was dead right when he said the most important question you will ever ask mm -hmm. is, is the universe friendly? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Might Help, Can't Hurt, Conversations with Leaders, Doers, and Friends. And my leader, doer friend today is Dr. Srikumar Rao. Srikumar, lovely to see you. And to see you, Michael. I always have fun when I'm chatting with you or uh, on one of your uh, <coughs> events. Well, so now I was trying to remember when we first met in person. I remember talking to you from a, a, a coffee shop in Manhattan, uh, like on the phone. That was the first time I, we, we spoke. But then we met in Marina del Rey, and I couldn't remember what yeah. year. W do you have any sense? Was it like 2012? Was it earlier, later? Many years ago, Michael. Yes, many years ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but... Um, by age, time simply flies. <laughs> Yeah, back when we used to need to wear ties instead of sweatshirts. I it was know. a whole other era. You know something? I can't even remember the last time I wore, wore a tie. And I have one tie-wearing occasion coming up, which is my son's uh, marriage. He's getting married this year. And I don't see a, an occasion for me to buy a tie. Again, I, I gave away a big chunk of my tie collection. I must have given away easily about 150 or so. Well, it was funny because I was being interviewed for some um, for a podcast the other day, and the interviewer was wearing a tie, and I'd kind of forgotten that people do that. Like, <laughs> like I haven't left the house. So I, you know, <laughs> it was, I know. <laughs> no, I, I, w w one of the things that I was hoping that um, we we could talk about is your experience, and I'd love to share mine of of what business owners and business people are, how are they adapting now? Very, very wide range, uh, uh, Michael. I have one of my clients whose business has completely dropped off the cliff. You know, his customers have stopped buying and he manufactures overseas. So they, even the shipments which were on the sea, they refuse to accept and they refuse to pay. So, you know, he has several million dollars worth of receivables, no new orders. So I'm, it'll be very, very difficult for him to survive. But he's a coaching client of mine, and he said, look, things are very difficult, but thanks to the work that I've done with you, you know, I'm, I'm fine personally. Uh, he's trying his level best to preserve as many of his employees as he possibly can. Yeah. And there are others whose uh, business is actually booming. They've switched from real life, I mean, real live, virtual with, uh, you know, yeah. with pivoting easily with no, no significant problems. 
Now, do you, do how much of do, how much of which businesses are thriving and which businesses are collapsing? Do you think is just that certain business niches adapt easily, and how much of it is the individual adapting? I don't think it's so much a business uh, niche as uh, the particular entrepreneur. Obviously, it's easier for some businesses to pivot. Like yeah. If you're a lawyer, for example, or you're doing any kind of work which is primarily cognitive, it's much easier for you to switch. But if you're a service business, especially a location-specific service business like a restaurant or so on, it's difficult. Yeah. But I have a couple of clients who are restaurants, and you know they've switched completely to uh, takeout, and not just takeout, but you know we go to deliver something that you never had before, and actually they're doing so much better than they used to do that they're thinking that uh, they might not uh, go back to the live dining at all. Yeah, and I, I, and I've had similar. You know, I've been working with a number of CEOs over the last nine months or so, and what I'm actually continually surprised and mostly heartened that that people can just either adapt what they're already doing, or I, I, the 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 guy I had the most sort of like I wouldn't know what to do was his entire business is made up of uh, restaurants. Uh, concert venues and bars. Uh -huh. And so literally they went and he had over 50 separate uh, venues. And so, you know, they went from, you know, a monthly turnover in the tens of millions to pretty much zero. Uh -huh. um, and yet he was actually one of the most together people around the whole thing of anyone I talked to. Yeah, I have another friend of mine for the same thing happened. He's in the business of arranging conferences, especially mm. large conferences. You know, conferences yeah. have tens of thousands of people coming. Of course, yeah. You can imagine what's happened to that business. Yeah, I know those conferences. They're the ones they hire you to speak at instead of me. I, I, don't, I don't know why, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know why either, but they're willing to take them. <laughs> Who am I to refuse them? <laughs> <laughs> That business has come to a crashing halt too. Yeah, but yeah, that, that, yeah. That was my son's business was the event management, and you know, so they would host. He worked for uh, one of the cities up in Oregon, mm -hmm. and they would host probably sixty events, I think, a year. Mm -hmm. And again, from sixty to zero, it, it, yeah. you know. Now, what about for? And I don't know if you. Sorry, go ahead. I, I said that being said. Uh, obviously, some businesses are going to be much, much more severely affected than others. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to make two points. Number one, in many instances, not all, but in many instances, the entrepreneur has many more options than would appear at first glance. And what really determines uh, how they fare is uh, how they view it. And irrespective of whether your business survives or fails or all of the other things, there's really no reason for you personally not to have this as a tremendous growth opportunity. Now, say more about that, because I think for a lot of people that I, I get, get to speak to on some of our courses online, they're not running big companies. They're just trying to stay afloat, just, just personally. What 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 is it that that you found really allows people to? And I know personal growth can can sound like a booby prize, like yeah. well, at least I'm growing. But to actually kind of have a great experience within this, here's it. One of the central thesis of uh, the work that I do is to show persons that you don't have control. We go through life, and what we're really trying to do is we're going to always trying to control. We're all control freaks. We're trying to control some part of our internal or external environment. Everything you do is an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. You married. Where did you get married? You saw this person of the opposite sex or same sex, depending upon your predilection, and you know it felt good. So two seconds or 10 seconds or 10 minutes later, you did it again, felt better, and you thought, gee, if you get married, uh, there'll be great sex and love and romance and companionship. Seems like a good idea. Let's do it. Are, are you? Is there a sign up? Yeah. Do you have a URL for that? I'd like to. I, we'll just put that in the interview. <laughs> Carry on. Sorry. What? Uh, so it's an attempt to control some part of your internal or external environment. Now my thesis is 
you try to control it and you think you can control it because there's always the notion you have that if I'm at point X and I want to go to point Y, I have to do A, B, C, and I'll get from X to Y. And many times in your life it works. So you say, see, I did it. I have control. In reality, any of a number of things that could have happened to derail you did not happen. Hmm. So be grateful. Be immensely grateful. But you don't have control. You never had control. You never will have control. And the sooner you accept that, the better. Now, what happens is a lot of the times persons want to have the illusion of control. So they say, here's what I got to do. I got to work hard and so on. And they intellectually accept I don't have control. But it's a very superficial level. So you might, for example, say, you know, my marriage is kind of rocky and I'm not sure whether it'll survive or not. I don't have control. Or you might say, I don't know if my daughter will get into Harvard. She's got good grades, but she's not at the top. So I don't know if she'll make it to Harvard or not. I don't have control. But underneath that is embedded a worldview. And in that worldview, there are some things which are given. Like if you run out of toilet paper, you go to a supermarket and pick some up. Or if you're hungry and there's no food in the house, you go to your restaurant and you know order something. Now, because of the pandemic, even those things that you took so much for granted are suddenly called into question. So you realize at a very visceral, deep level that you really don't have control. And for some people, it is tremendously frightening. But for persons who have thought about it, said, yeah, you know, this is the time when the illusion of control broke down. So where do I go from here? And it simply becomes, say, another uh, <coughs> uh, pivot to make. In fact, uh, would you like to know how to have a terrific day every day? Uh, well, I wouldn't, obviously, but maybe some of the people... Day every day. Yes. No, let's do it. Let's have a terrific day every day. <laughs> it's actually very simple to have a terrific day every day. And the way to have a terrific day every day is to get up in the morning and decide you're going to have a terrific day. See, most of us make the mistake of confusing two things which have nothing to do with having a terrific day, with having a terrific day. Mm -hmm. And those two things are stuff should happen, which I want to have happen, and stuff should not happen that I don't want to have happen. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any control over either one of those. As I said, we never have control. We only have the illusion of control. So if you're smart, what you're going to do is you're going to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to have a terrific day. And invariably, shit is going to fall from the sky. And I'm going to reserve two hours of my terrific day to cleaning up the shit that's inevitably going to fall. And I'm going to have a terrific time doing it. And if you do that, you will find, yes, indeed, it is possible for you to have a terrific day every day. Well, it's early here so far, but it's going well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so really? like my favorite, I love the, you know, one of the, I talk a lot in my work about the illusion of control and, and how it kind of messes with you. <laughs> That's what, 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 okay. <laughs> what, what are my, my favorite uh, things that happened on a training once is somebody was listening and arguing and uh, over the period of time, they, they saw it. They started to see for themselves. Oh yeah, I don't actually control that. No, oh, yeah, I don't actually control that. And, and, and she said, do you know, I feel like I'm finally ready to let go of the reins. And and I said to her, yeah, but you're letting go of the reins on a toy rocking horse being carried along in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> that is a, such a good one that I'll probably steal it. <laughs> Please, but but it's it it is that. It it's it's we we even think we're in control of whether or not we think we're in control. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, layers to that onion, my friend. I absolutely love speaking to you. Yes, you're right. That is exactly true. Now, how for I can imagine, in fact, some people in the comment section are saying, oh my God, that's so liberating. But I can imagine that there are other people going, that's terrifying. Mm -hmm. How what is it that makes that either liberating or terrifying? How you look upon it. See, it is totally liberating if you recognize nothing is under my control anyway. But I'm going to try the level best I can, because here's the mistake most of us make. And here's the way most people live their life. I set a goal for myself. I tried very hard to achieve it. I succeeded. Life's a blast. 
or I set a goal for myself. I tried very hard to achieve it. I fail. Life sucks. So we live a life oscillating on a sinusoidal curve between elation and despair, and we tend to spend more time in the despair end of the spectrum. It's a lousy way to live. There is a better way, and that is set your goals. Make them ambitious a stretch goal. It's just fine, and try your level best to achieve it. But once you've set the goal, forget about the goal. The only importance of a goal is to establish direction. Hmm. Once the direction has been established, pour all of your emotional energy into one of the actions you have to undertake in order to meet your goal. If you succeed, fantastic. If you don't succeed, fantastic. Because the mistake we make is we think that the benefit of setting a goal and trying our level best to achieve the goal is achieving the goal. Mm -hmm. Not so. The benefit of setting a goal and trying our level best to reach the goal is the learning and growth that happen in us and to us as we try our level best to achieve the goal. If we actually achieve the goal, that is a bonus. Be immensely grateful. If you don't achieve the goal, the learning and growth have already happened, so you're ahead of the game. It's a no lose proposition. So recognize that stuff is not under your control. If something is not under your control, why the hell would you let that steal your equanimity, your calm, your peace of mind? It's silly. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the thing is, you know, we do a program every year called Creating the Impossible, where we have people set these impossible 90 day goals. And it is always surprising to me how many of them do get achieved. But of course, the large number of them don't within the 90 days. A lot of them happen over time. But the whole game is just to see that's never been up to you anyways. Mm -hmm. And so you start to just get really clear about what it is to, you know, one of the phrases I use in the program is, you know, to throw yourself into it as if your life depended on it, knowing full well that it doesn't. And there is something incredibly powerful about showing up in that weird dichotomy. I mean, it sounds weird when you describe it, where you're all in on something that you can't make happen. Yeah. Or the whole point is it doesn't matter whether you can or not, because the idea is if you go out and say, hey, I, Michael Neal, am going to do it, there's, you're, you're a puny creature, not much is going to happen. Oh, you know me. <laughs> yourself is, you know, the universe is working with me and through me, and the universe decides it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. So with the universe as my partner, I can't lose. I've heard you talk about uh, the that that if 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 you live in a me-centered universe, your life will be mediocre. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. Yes. Yeah. Can you share some some more about that? Oh, absolutely. You know. Many years ago, three centuries ago, Galileo got into a spot of trouble because he postulated that perhaps the sun does not move around the earth, perhaps the earth moves around the sun. I read about that. Yeah. Every single one of us believes that Galileo got it wrong. The earth doesn't move around the sun, it revolves around us personally, and we really believe that. <laughs> I just have to I just have to tell you, my wife told me literally yesterday, we were having a conversation and she said her mother used to always say to her and her brother, the world doesn't revolve around you, you know. And she and her brother would go back to their rooms and go, she's wrong, it does. <laughs> Michael, think about how no matter what happens, we very quickly bring it down to what's the impact on me. Your spouse gets a great job offer and you say, how's this gonna affect our relationship? Your daughter drops out of high school to begin an in-depth exploration of controlled substances, and you go, how much does rehab cost? And is it covered by insurance? No matter what happens, we have a very quick way of bringing it down to, how does this impact me? Hmm. That's what being in a me-centered universe is all about. And that's where you spend your time. You are going to live an essentially mediocre existence, punctuated with flashes of pleasure, but you know, mediocre. The only way you can get out of that is to find a cause which is bigger than you are, a cause which brings a greater good to a greater community. And you have tremendous flexibility in defining both the greater good and the greater community. Hmm. And if you can't find something like that to which you can subsume, if not your whole life, at least a big chunk of it, you know, you live a very ho-hum, uh, you live Thoreau's life of quiet desperation. No, what, what is that for you? What, what, what is that larger thing that subsumes you? 
Well, there's two parts to it. One part of it is I believe that all of life is a journey and it's primarily a spiritual growth journey. And uh, everything that you ever do in life is you work on yourself. And all that's given to you is a tool. Your wife, your spouse, your children, your business, your clients, all those are tools. You try to use them as skillfully as you can, but as you use them skillfully, what you're really doing is you're working on yourself. So every client I have, I try to make his or her life uh, a lot better. I try to get them to understand, you know, the way is to move to a higher level of consciousness. And uh, all of them get it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come to me as a coaching client to begin with. Some get it more clearly and more urgently than others. But I try to meet them where they are, help them progress. And in the process of doing that, I am earning a living. But also, that that's what I do. Yeah. So my goal is, I don't really have a goal. I'm just heading in that direction. How, however far I travel is fine. So I don't set goals anymore. It's interesting. So do you, do you, I mean, you've, you've already sort of explained the difference in, in, in between a goal and a direction, but when you're working with companies, mm -hmm. how, how do, you know, so for example, like a lot of the larger companies I work with have targets that are oh, for share as much as for them and things like that. What What's that uh, adaptation between recognizing, look, it's just a direction and if I, I don't hit this target, I'm in trouble? I was teaching in London Business School and uh, one of my classmates, uh, one of my students who was in the executive education program was a very senior sales executive in a Fortune 25 company. Uh, he was responsible for sales in Europe, Middle East, Asia, Africa, Australia, a big chunk of the world outside of North America. Yeah. And he said, Professor Rao, what you're saying is all very well, but I have numbers to meet. And this quarter, I'm not going to meet my numbers. And if I go to my boss and say, you know, it really doesn't matter, Professor Rao says so, it's uh, not going to be well received. And everybody burst out laughing because they were thinking exactly the same thing. Yeah. So what I told him is, yeah, you're right. So you can do what you normally would have done, which is go into an emotional downturn, figure out who you can blame and why you're not responsible for what happened and all the usual stuff that goes on. Or you can simply accept that you had numbers to meet, you tried and you didn't succeed. And as a result of that, stuff could happen up to and including your involuntary severance from your position. You could get fired. Mm -hmm. If that happens, when that happens, you'll deal with it. But in the meantime, you will accept that, uh, you know, things didn't work out the way you would like. And uh, why don't you deal with it? And he said, OK, that makes sense. Uh, so he went off uh, on an outside with his team, then he went to his boss and said, hey, boss, we're not going to meet our numbers. I don't know what the exact shortfall is, but this is the order of magnitude of the shortfall. And here's what I plan to do about it. And there was some revenue enhancement measures, some cost containment measures, and some let's restructure and see what happens actions. And those were very unusual business circumstances. So the boss looked at it and said, fine, go do it. And what could have been a major derailment became a minor bump in the road. Yeah. See, regardless of whether or not you get upset and go do all of those things that you normally do, and we shoot a lot of second arrows on ourselves. And I'll tell you about second arrows in just a minute. Uh, yeah. But if you follow my approach, you do your level best. And the funny thing is, the less concerned you are about your goal in, the ter in terms of obsessing about it, yeah. Or you focus on your actions. What is it that I can do to achieve my goal? And you pour your emotional energy into that. The higher the probability that you will actually get to the goal you want to get to. Yeah. So it's a little bit like if you're in a negotiation, do you recognize you're never in a stronger position than when you're genuinely prepared to walk away? Oh, I... I... I want one of the best deals that I ever negotiated, and I'm using air quotes because you'll see in a minute, was somebody came to me from a company and said, look, we want you to speak at our uh, year end event and we know you're really expensive, but we can only go to this number. And that number was actually three times what I charged. <laughs> But my reputation of being willing to walk away was such that they, 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 they preemptively Exactly. Stop me. When you were, you're never in a stronger position than when you're genuinely prepared to work. It's exactly the same way. You know, if you are there and you really have a goal and you really want to get there, but you're perfectly okay whether you do or you don't, then the universe more often than not will see that you do get there. 
and you will get there with great peace of mind and equanimity. It's only well, way. one of my absolute favorite things I've ever read anywhere is a, a model that you share. And I don't know if are, are you ready to succeed was your first book or just the first of your books that I read. And you talk about the benevolent universe model. We, could you share that? Because I adore okay. that. The vast majority of us live in a world where here we are going around doing our thing and there's the universe going around doing its thing and the universe doesn't know I exist and it couldn't care less. Sometimes it seems to be helping me, sometimes it seems to be frustrating me, but essentially it's a random process and the universe is indifferent to my existence. In fact, it's ignorant and indifferent to my existence. But Einstein said the most important question you'll ever ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? Now, we revere Einstein as a great scientist, and he was. But he also was a philosopher, and he had a pretty intimate understanding of the universe. And Einstein said the most important question you will ever ask yourself is, is the universe friendly? Now, let's assume that the universe was not ignorant, it was aware of you, and not only was it aware of you, but it was well disposed towards you. The universe was your friend. So the universe is your friend, and why does it give you stuff you don't want? You know, I wanted to go to Wimbledon, and we planned for years, and I bought tickets last year, and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't go because the dark tournament was cancelled, and anyway, there are no planes taking me from New York to London. Why does the universe give you stuff you don't want? You want to go on vacation, you're stuck in a pandemic. Well, what if the universe gives you not what you want, but exactly what you need for your learning and growth? It's like you're a small child, you're a baby or you're an infant, and you want a cup of ice cream and your parents give you fruits and vegetables. And you don't want fruits and vegetables. You want a tub of ice cream, but your parents give you fruits and vegetables. And it's only when you have a much greater level of wisdom and maturity that you can say, thank God I got fruits and vegetables. Mm. What if the universe was like that? It doesn't give you what you want, but it gives you exactly what you need for your learning and growth. What if? Regardless of whether, whether or not the universe is benevolent, if you believed it was friendly, your experience of life would improve dramatically. <clears throat> because you never bemoan, oh my God, why did this happen to me? You look at, you know, there's a lesson in here for me, and what's the lesson, and how quickly can I learn it so I can then move on to the next one? And you'll find you become incredibly resilient, and the more resilient you are internally, the more the universe responds, and, you know, it's a virtuous cycle. Yeah, I talk about it a lot in my work as the kindness of the design. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it is funny because I don't know if that's true either, but it feels true no, <laughs> michael initially you say i don't know if it's true or not but it's a good model and i'm adopting it and you will but you will reach a personal tipping point where at a very deep level beyond cognition beyond trying to think it you know that this is so and it's a very very deep level it's a level beyond the mind it's a level beyond your cognitive process and when you're anchored in that, then you no longer think the universe is kind. You know that it is benevolent. And other people might think you're cuckoo and, you know, what's he smoking or what kind of trip is he on? And I want that trip and so on. But people who, who are there will recognize what I'm talking about. It, it's no longer something up for questioning. You know in the deepest possible way. And if you've been doing this long enough, eventually every single one will get to that point where you know that, you know, in my program, I say the point you want to get to is where you have a very deep sense of well-being. I don't talk about happiness in the normal way. We're very cavalier talking about happiness. I had a great deal, so I'm happy. Or, you know, I saw a wonderful movie or a play and I'm happy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a very deep sense of well-being. The knowledge that you're okay, the knowledge that you have always been okay, the knowledge that you will always be okay. In fact, you cannot not be okay. You're in the human condition. As long as you're in the human condition, stuff will happen. There will be relationship problems. There will be career setbacks. There will be financial lack. All of that is part of being in the human condition. And you will deal with each of these situations as appropriate 
when they arise. But you will do it from the space of I am okay, I have always been okay, and I will always be okay. And you can anchor yourself in that when you realize that the universe is friendly. That's why Einstein was dead right when he said the most important question you will ever ask mm -hmm. is, is the universe friendly? Well, it's, I mean, which is beautifully, beautifully put. One of the bits of the, um, of, of the metaphor you share in the book about the, um, the trapeze, that, it, you know, if you imagine being a trapeze artist, you, you sometimes have to let go before the other trapeze is in place, but you know it will be. It will be there exactly where you need it and exactly when you need it. Yeah, and that has been my experience um, for years. I, 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 I once hired a coach to help a uh, business coach to work on my business, and he looked at our figures and numbers and said, well, but you're doing great. And I was like, well, yeah, but every year it feels like I'm pulling a rabbit out of my butt. Like, you know, and I'd like to do it right was the way I had it in my head, that there was a right way to do it. And at the end of our time together, you know, I, I said, you know, what I really learned from our time together is rabbits live up my butt. <laughs> that is actually just how it works. But I thought it was supposed to work differently. And and that that the freedom that comes with knowing hey, I'm not going to know till I do. Exactly correct. That takes all the pressure off to figure it out in advance. And, and there's just so much freedom in that. Complete freedom. Yeah. So did you find in, in your career, because you, you worked at a lot of prestigious business schools, you were, I think, lecturing at Columbia when I first met you, or at least that's my memory, but that, that introducing kind of spirituality in business was difficult at any point or was it just a natural fit? Yes, it was. I never talked about spirituality or religion. I mean, I did say it like, oh, let's, let's see what it is. But apart from that, I never did spirituality. But people who take my course are pretty sharp cookies, so they quickly figure out that's what it is. But I didn't make any overt show of it. And uh, also what happens is, my course was unlike any course at any business school ever. That's why it's the only program. In fact, I believe I'm the only business school professor who's got his own alumni association. And my mm -hmm. students come from, you know, all the top business schools and, you know, many others all around. And we've got a global community now. Most of them began as skeptics. You know, this is obviously it doesn't work. And what's this doing in business school in the first place? But at the same time, this guy has been written up all over the place. Has been in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, and there's a weakness to get into his course, and it's the highest rated. So let me see what it is, you know, just to cover all bases. Yeah, just in case. Yes. So the first day, you know, they don't have chips on their shoulders. They have two by fours on their shoulders. <laughs> but I discovered very early that when you're dealing with very bright people who are also quite arrogant, by the way, as most people in top business schools are, you can never tell them anything. Because the moment you make a statement, A, very bright people are immediate for thinking under what set of circumstances is not A, the correct answer. So yeah. I tell them, look, everything I'm going to tell you is false. You push hard enough. You penetrate deep enough. You, all the models I share with you will crumple. And uh, what you don't recognize, however, is that the models you hold so strongly will also crumple, only you've just not subjected them to the same scrutiny. So everything I'm going to share with you is false. So don't even ask yourself, is this true or false, good or bad, right or wrong? Because I'm telling you up front, it's false. Yeah. Let's say, does this work for me in my life now better than what I'm currently using? Is this working? Will this work for me better in my life now than what I'm currently using? If the answer to that is yes, adopt it. If the answer to that is no, move on. Yeah. They do, and they find, hey, gee, you know, this thing really works. And so gradually they move from skeptics to believers to quite a few become evangelists. What well, one of the most impactful one liners I ever read was in a, a little book of Taoist wisdom, the Sin Sin Ming. Mm -hmm. And the Zen patriarch who wrote it, I can't remember his name, but he he said, Do not seek the truth, simply cease to cherish opinions. 
And that for me, what you just described is how that plays out. It's not, okay, well, is this true or is this true? It's like, well, okay, this is made up and this is made up and this is made up. And what kind of, I, I, was, I was talking to a client yesterday and the best metaphor that came to mind is I said, it's, you know, personal and, and physical and mental development are construction jobs. Exactly. Spiritual development is like taking a leaf blower mm -hmm. and, and clearing away stuff that's sitting on top. Exactly. It's not that you learn something new. It's you drop all the stuff with yeah. true. Yeah. And that's such a, it's funny because that's been the direction of my work very strongly for the last 13 years or so. But it is, it is funny how contrary that is. Yeah. We're so used to working with our hands, even if we work with our minds, like we're it, it, that, well, okay, what do I do? And it's just really odd to be in a domain where your willingness to do is not the primary motive force. Okay. Now, I keep saying, and this is one of the core uh, teachings of uh, you know my coaching, my programs, don't get into the frantic doing. Get into the calm being. Mm -hmm. Who you are being is much more important than what you are doing. You know, in our life, we're all accustomed to rush. Say, for example, you're in, uh, single and you want to be in a relationship, so you go off to all the internet sites and fill in your profile and you hit up your friends who could introduce you to people who are potential dates and all the rest of that. Or you don't have a job and, again, you go to the internet sites or monster.com or whatever, you go on informational in, uh, interviews and you desperately try and get a job. But... A lot of the times, if you become internally clear and calm, I'm not saying you don't have to do outward work, but if you do it from a space where you have crystal clarity, you'll find that there's much less external effort needed than you thought. And you'll find that your life is going on a, a glide path as opposed to you know being chopped up in stormy seas. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna. I, I I like to finish um, these shows each week with the um, with a question. So, you are now just temporarily, just for the next five minutes, emperor of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, so you have the power of decree. Mm -hmm. You can command change. Mm -hmm. What is your first decree as newly crowned emperor of the universe? The first decree would be to. Make a change in our educational system so right from a very young age, persons, children become aware of the fact that the world that they live in is not real. It's a construct. Every single one of us lives in a matrix. This is not a matrix constructed by an alien civilization out to enslave us. It's a matrix we create with our mental chatter and our mental models. And I would like every person to understand how the process works, how they've created the world that they then proceed to experience. And once they understand the process, they recognize that if they don't like the world that they're living in, they can deconstruct the parts of it that are not working and build it up again. And they can do that over and over again. It's a rest of your life process. Beautiful. See, I knew I picked the right guy to be emperor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mar, it's been an absolute pleasure. If, if people want to learn more about you and your work, is the place to go the Rao Institute org? No, dot com. Dot com. Okay. So the Rao Institute, R A O Institute dot com. And we'll put the links in the in the show notes as well. The Rao Institute, T H E R A O Institute dot com. Beautiful. And, uh, if they do, and there's a button there called Join Our Community. So if they click on that, then uh, they'll get access to my blogs and uh, uh, my information about my programs and so on. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. And, and, it's, and I can just say from experience, the more time you spend with this guy, the better. Oh, all right. Thank you. Go ahead. Rikumar, an absolute pleasure, sir. It's a, a delight to see you doing well. Always, Michael. I always enjoy our conversations. And you had me on a couple of times to your uh, coaching classes. Uh, I had a blast, I must say. Wonderful. Thank you, my friend. Take care. Oh, but you have a great day. <laughs>